welcome back. In this video, we look at the design of the MIPS CPU. The instruction set architecture and the CPU are designed together. Designers determine what types of instructions the CPU should execute and how long it takes to execute each one. The instruction count of a program depends largely on the ISA. Next, we look at how CPUs are designed, which impacts the clock cycle time and the number of cycles per instruction. What you see is a conceptual diagram of what's going on inside a MIPS CPU. The major component is the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit. There are also two smaller ALUs, which are simply adders. There are three blocks of memory, a block of memory for instructions, a block of memory for data, and our register file. All of the connecting lines are buses for data, addresses, and control signals. The term data path refers to the path that information takes flowing through the CPU. Of course, here we're looking at an abstraction of the CPU, abstracting to the main components away from the millions of transistors in different parts of the CPU. Let's think about how a sub-instruction would travel through this data path. The PC program counter is one of the registers in the register file, but it's shown to the left in the diagram to illustrate its role in pointing to the next instruction to be executed. Let's say the next instruction is this sub. First, the instruction is decoded, broken up into the opcode and register fields. The T1 and T2 registers are read from the register file into the ALU. The ALU subtracts T1 minus T2 and writes the result back into the register file in register T0. Meanwhile, the PC has been updated by 4 to point to the next instruction. Any R-type instruction would follow a similar path. Now let's say the next instruction is this load word. First, the instructions decoded, broken up into the opcode, the register fields, and the immediate fields. The T2 register is read from the register file into the ALU, as is the 4 from the lower 16 bits of the instruction. The ALU adds 4 plus the contents of T2 to calculate the address. The contents of that address are read from the data memory, then written back into the register file into register T0. Meanwhile, the PC has been updated by 4 to point to the next instruction. Now let's say the next instruction is this branch. The instruction is decoded. The two registers, T1 and T2, are read into the ALU. If they're not equal, nothing happens, and the PC will be updated by 4 as usual to point to the instruction below the branch. If they are equal, this second adder will calculate the branch target address and the PC will be updated to point to that location. This diagram shows some control signals being added in blue. Control signals are like traffic lights in a complicated city. They direct where and when data flows. Most of these blue lines are a single bit wide, so they're binary, one or zero. Other buses vary in length, as we'll discuss. Whenever two inputs join to become only one output, we need a multiplexer. For example, here, the PC could be updated in one of two ways. It could be updated by adding 4 as usual, or it could be updated to point to a branch target address. The blue selection line comes into the multiplexer to determine how the PC is updated. We'll go through these multiplexers in much more detail later. Most of the circuits that we see, including the ALU and the adders, are combinational logic. But any memory component will be sequential logic. Sequential logic, as we discussed before, operates on a system clock. Our book assumes that things happen on the rising edge of the clock. Data can be read any time, but the clock signal is used to determine when to write to memory. The small block diagram to the left is showing data coming in, but it won't actually be written out to Q until the clock signal says it's time. We see that over here in the timing diagram. The data is ready before the clock signal, 
If the right signal is high and the clock is transitioning from 0 to 1, then we'll write to the output Q. That's shown in the red squiggly line. Combinational logic is updated whenever the inputs change. So registers can be read and written in the same clock cycle. That's illustrated in the left diagram. Sequential logic can only be updated or written to on the clock edge. We see that on the right diagram. Let's say state element 1 is a register. It can be read anytime, but it can only be written to at the leading clock edge. Next, we take a more detailed look at the data path one section at a time to see the purpose of each section. First, the instruction is fetched. Here we see the two state elements, the PC and the instruction memory. The PC is written at the end of every clock cycle and therefore doesn't need a write control signal. The PC points to the next instruction to be executed, which will be written out on this bus here. The small ALU is really a simple adder used to update the PC by 4. Here we see what happens with the registers in the ALU for any R-type instruction. Two registers will be read from the register file into the ALU. Then the ALU does whatever arithmetic or logic operation the instruction is. And then the results are written back to the right register. The registers can be read at any time and can be written back when the register write signal is 1. And this explains how the same register can be read and written in the same clock cycle. For a load word or store word, the ALU's job is to calculate the address. It uses the 16-bit immediate field in the lower part of the instruction that sign extended and comes in as the second operand to the ALU. The first operand will be the RS register. For a load, memory is read and that value is written back to the write register. For a store, we write to memory. For a branch instruction, we read the two register operands. The ALU compares them. Here we're assuming a branch equal instruction. The ALU can determine if the registers are equal by subtracting them. The adder on top will calculate the branch target address. It will sign extend the 16-bit immediate field, which represents the displacement in words, adding that value to the PC. In the execute stage, the ALU for an R-type instruction does the operation add, subtract, and so forth. For a load word or store word, the ALU is used to calculate an address. And for a branch instruction, the ALU is used to compare registers. The data memory is only accessed for a load word or store word instruction. The address was calculated from the ALU. The store will write a register to memory. A load will read the contents of a memory address and write it back to a register file. Here we see the full data path. For now, showing the control signals just coming out of the blue in blue. Our first design here, each instruction executes in one long clock cycle. In this first implementation, we're assuming a reduced instruction set just for illustration purposes. So it's just a few R-type instructions, only load word and store word, and only one branch, branch equal. However, if you understand how these instructions are executed, you will understand all of the instructions. Let's look at how an add instruction or any R-type instruction goes through the CPU. After the instruction is read, it's decoded. The three register addresses go into the register file. RS is T1 or 9. RT is T3 or 11. And our destination register is S0 16. The contents of the RS register T1 are read directly into the ALU. The contents of the RT register T2 go through the multiplexer into the ALU. The two 32-bit operands, T1 and T3, are added together by the ALU, and the result comes out, bypasses data memory, goes through the multiplexer, and is written back to the register file into register S0. Meanwhile, the PC has been updated by 4. 
R-type instructions do not access the data memory and don't use the adder at the upper right. Let's think about what happens with a load word. After the instruction is decoded, the RS register, which is S0 in this case, is read directly into the ALU. The second ALU operand comes from the lower half of the load word instruction itself. The 8 will be picked out of the instruction, sign extended to 32 bits, go through the multiplexer, and come in as the second argument to the ALU. The ALU adds 8 to the contents of register S0 to calculate the address. The address is sent to data memory. The contents of that memory location are read, go through this multiplexer, and are written back to the register file to register T0. Meanwhile, the PC is updated by 4. Load and store instructions don't use the adder at the upper right. After the branch instruction is decoded, the RS and RT registers, in this case T3 and T4, are read into the ALU. The ALU can subtract the two registers and determine if they're zero. This arrow in the diagram in the book should not be there. The zero will actually go to different circuitry as we'll see later. If T3 and T4 are not equal, nothing happens. The PC is updated by four to point to the instruction after the branch. If T3 equals T4, the offset stored in the lower half of the instruction is sign extended, shifted left to point to a word boundary, and added to the current value of the PC in order to force the PC to now point to the branch target address of exit. Branch instructions don't access data memory. We've built a simple MIPS CPU for a subset of instructions. Each instruction executes in one long clock cycle. Next time, we'll look at how control signals are generated.